Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, one of the very few evening forums that we have. As a matter of fact, we try and do one a season if we can. And sometimes we're lucky we get a fantastic topic and a fantastic speaker, and today is no exception. We're certainly very lucky. Give me just one quick moment. How many people have never been to a forum event before? Okay. I'm going to give you just the fastest history of the forum, and really, it will be fast, because the forum's been around for 61 years. The forum's mission, to bring people to issues and issues to people. There are other civic organizations in the greater Portland area. You'll find they're often issuing reports, taking stands, telling you that you should vote this way on this initiative, you should support this person. I'm really, really proud of the organization that I have the pleasure of representing as president. We take no stands at all. Now, that doesn't mean we're not opinionated. Those of you that know me would probably be able to say that you know, I have opinions. Our entire board has opinions. But as an organization, we maintain neutrality. We want to bring people together to hear about issues, to learn about issues, to discuss issues. As such, we have been bringing speakers to the environments, the different environments, for over 61 years, as I said, every Monday. September through June, except for holidays, we meet at noon with different speakers, different topics. You'll find a sheet on your chair which tells you just what's going on through the end of this year. The forum season ends on June 26th. We'll start up again the first Monday after Labor Day. We're not going to tell you who our first speaker is next year because, well, gosh, right now I don't know how we'd ever follow what we're about to present. But we have a wonderful history of good speakers. We have a good, hard-working board. And today, without any further exceptions, we have one wonderful speaker with one horrific topic. And yes, I said it's horrific because it's hard to understand, but I think we'll all leave here understanding a little more. La a week ago Monday, we had Governor John Kitzhaber talk about Oregon's history with health care. And I think we all left a lot better educated. Today, the topic is somewhat larger. Ladies and gentlemen, without a long introduction for a gentleman who needs no introduction, Governor John Kitsap. Pull this off here if I can. There we go. Is that all right? You're great. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to have this opportunity. We've got a bit of time tonight. So what I want to try to do is actually get you to the point where you really understand what's going on in Washington, D.C., which is no small task. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, plenty of time to kind of kick around and, and, and get into it more deeply. Uh, first, I want to apologize that um, I made these slides myself. Um, when I left office, I became my own scheduler and uh, technology support person, which has not been a happy combination. And so I've made these slides. So I want to apologize for them in advance. Here's one of them. Um, I was asked to speak uh, a while back to a group that does geospatial information systems. And so I thought I'd put this slide up to show that I knew a little bit about their topic. I drew this when I was about eight after my father read me Treasure Island. And as you can see, there's a lot of geospatial information on this slide. We, we know that there's a safe harbor that opens to the south there with a couple of rocks. And there's an old fort up in the northwest corner. And we got some apparently some mountains down in the southwest, and, and of course you know there's treasure buried under all those X's. And I was going on thinking I was pretty, pretty smart, and one of the guys had gotten out his phone, and he checked out the longitude and latitude, and got up and told me that my island was located somewhere in North Carolina, so uh, I asked for a little latitude for my slides. Um, I started practicing in Roseburg, Oregon in, uh, in 1974. And I was 27 years old and about four years out of my internship. And one of the things that I remember most about those early years was how incredibly vulnerable the people that came to see me were. And I think whenever you go to see a, a doctor, particularly in the ER, you're very vulnerable. These are people who are hurt, uh, confused, uh, frightened, and uh, they'd come to me for help. And they didn't know me, but they put their trust and in some cases their lives in my hand. And it seemed like a pretty big responsibility for a 27-year-old guy. And I did everything I could to help them. Uh, that was why I went into medicine. I felt that that was my responsibility. So I, I, I used everything I could. I used every bit of technology I could get my hands on, regardless of the cost. And sometimes uh, we weren't able to save someone. And I've been in that room many, many times when you just weren't able to pull it off, whether it was heavy trauma or whether it was a heart attack. 
And then I'd have to do something which, which I, I, I used to call walking across the hall. And the hall came in the ER through the big ambulance doors, and on the right were the big doors that went into the emergency room with the trauma bays and the, you know, the examining rooms. And on the left side, on the other side of the hall, was this room with a sofa and some chairs and a coffee table where the families of people who had come in by ambulance waited to find out about their loved ones. And uh, I hated walking across the hall. It just felt like this hopeless, long journey across 30 feet of tile with nothing but compassion and bad news to tell somebody that their father or their daughter or their husband was dead, that they'd come to me for, for, uh, for help and I wasn't able, to, wasn't able to do it. And I think that it's that human element that is missing from the national health care debate. You know, our president has said, who knew that health care could be so complicated? But at one level, it's not complicated at all. It's a very personal event that takes place between someone seeking care and someone providing care, and it happens one person at a time. And that's just literally not in the discussion. This discussion has become very narrowly framed. It's very, very partisan, and sometimes I think it has more to do with who's going to have the advantage in next year's midterm elections than it does with solving a very real problem for, uh, for Americans. And it's created huge uncertainty. There's uncertainty about whether Obamacare will be repealed or not. And if it is, what's it going to be replaced with? There's uncertainty about the insurance market, what, what's going to happen to your premiums. And there's uncertainty for the 20 plus million people who got covered under the Affordable Care Act and for millions of other people who are literally one illness away from personal bankruptcy. So let me just ask a question. How many people here are on Medicare? So a lot of people on Medicare. Is there anyone on Medicaid or on the Oregon Health Plan, or have, has been, this gentleman on the Oregon Health Plan? How about people that have um, uh, uh, coverage through the workplace? A few of those. And how about people who have coverage but it's not through the workplace, they have to buy an individual policy? Okay. So we have run the gamut here, and, I, and, and I'm going to speak to each one of you as we go, go along today, not so much to Medicare because the Affordable Care Act really, really didn't do much to Medicare, and we can talk about that, but that's not really part of the national debate at, at this point in time. So if we're going to solve this problem, it's first important for us to stop a second and ask what it is we're trying to do. Is the objective of our healthcare system to finance and deliver medical care, or is it to help people stay healthy? And they're two different things. And I think most people would agree that the objective here is health, right? So if the objective is health, we need to recognize that healthcare is not necessarily synonymous with health. Healthcare doesn't have any, it's a means to an end, not an end in itself. I don't know anyone who wants attenuated flu virus squirted into their arm. They just don't want to get the flu. So healthcare is a means to an end, not an end in itself. It doesn't have any intrinsic value outside its relationship to a positive health outcome, except as an economic commodity, which is pretty much what's going on today. Furthermore, if you look at the things that have the biggest impact on your lifetime health status, healthcare is pretty, pretty small. Most of the things that affect your lifetime health status have to do with your genetics, have to do with lifestyle and behavioral choices, socioeconomic issues, whether you have a good job, a safe home, a stable family. And healthcare contributes only about 10% to the overall health of the population. And that becomes really clear when we compare the United States to the OECD nations, which is most of Europe and uh, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, Australia, to the US on a number of key factors. So if you look at the percentage of the gross domestic product that we spend on health care, you'll notice that the United States is an outlier, over 19%, and the OECD nations are about uh, 10%. So we're an outlier in terms of the total part of our budget we're spending on medical care. Then if you look at how much we invest in, um, in social investments and medical care, right? So the total investment in health, you can see that the OECD nations uh, and the U.S. are pretty comparable, but you notice that we spend far more in medical care and less on social investments, and the OECD nations are just the opposite. And then if you look at the ratio of medical spending to social investment, you can see we're an outlier far down on the, on the other side. And those nations have far better population health statistics than the United States. Better infant mortality, they have uh, longer lifespans, uh, just uh, across the scale. So the question becomes, why is it that knowing this, and no one disputes this, why is it that we continue to support this huge disparity between medical spending and social investments? And I think the answer is, is it comes back to that person, the personal nature of medical care and the intersection between human mortality that happens one person at a time 
and medical technology. And to illustrate that, I'm going to tell you just a little brief story here. A few years ago, I took a friend of mine down the Rogue River in Southern Oregon. This was a person from New York City who'd never been in this kind of uh, wilderness before, and it was August and the salmon were running. And there's a lot of fish in the river, and, you know, dead fish on the banks. And one day we, we flew by this magnificent male Chinook, maybe 35, 40 pounds, just incredible fish. And, um, you know, he's struggling though. He's, he's still upright, but he's struggling against the current and his, and his fading strength. And he was just all beat up. And any of you who've done much fishing here in Oregon have seen those big fall spawners. You know, his, his fins are all scarred. He's got you know, his, his fins are tattered and he's got that white fungus on him and scratches all over his body. And my friend looks at him, looks at, looks at him and, 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 and he was way downstream from the spawning bed, right? He probably wasn't ever going to make it. In, in dying, he was going to give his body to the river and provide the nutrients that were essential to the next generation, right? And I've always thought the life cycle of the salmon is just a lovely metaphor, not only about the relationship between life and death, but also about the responsibility that each generation owes to the next. My friend, not so much. She looks at the fish and she says, oh my God, what's wrong with that fish? And without really thinking, he said, well, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just dying. Now, you don't hear that often in the halls of Congress or halls of medicine. Well, there's nothing wrong with you, Joe. You're, you're just dying, right? And that's because in our society, we don't view death as a natural part of the life process. We view it as something abnormal. I was trained to view it as a failure walking across the hall, right? And no one wants to die, and no one wants to see their loved ones die. So we've developed this huge array of diagnostic and medical interventions with which we seek to treat disease and disability and stave off the inevitable consequences of aging. And that's produced this huge and increasingly profitable industry that is committed not just to developing new medical technologies, but to financing and delivering them for the benefit of individuals. And if you look at this from the individual standpoint, it is miraculous. I mean, what we can do today with medicine is truly miraculous for individuals. When you look at it on a social basis, though, there's a darker side. Because this wouldn't create a problem if everyone could afford the cost of his or her own health care. But we can't. Today, we increasingly rely on public resources to finance the cost of care for individuals. So we've got a system that provides unlimited care and benefit, one individual at a time, are relying on limited public resources to finance the cost of that care. So really at the heart of the healthcare debate is how we spend public dollars and who benefits from that allocation. People who can afford the cost of their own healthcare really aren't the problem. It's the rest of us, which is the majority of us. So our healthcare system has got two parts. It's got a public side and a private side. The public side has got Medicare, which is an entitlement program that everybody gets when they turn 65. And we're not going to talk a lot about that today. We can, I'm not going to say that in, in my formal presentation, but we can talk more if you want a little bit later. Then you got Medicaid. Medicaid is a program for low-income people, but when it was created, it wasn't for all low-income people. It was certain categories. Um, pregnant women, families with children, people who were, who were elderly and needed long-term care, people who were blind or had disabilities. But adults without kids aren't covered by Medicaid, no matter how poor they might be. Now, one of the things we did with the Oregon Health Plan back in, way back in 1989, is we said we want to get federal matching dollars for our Medicaid program for everybody with an income below the federal poverty level. So, uh, and, and we've done that since 19, so 20 years later, uh, the Obamacare moved that up to 138, but essentially we changed that. But basically the program isn't for all, all poor people. You have to fit into a category. And then on the, on the other side, you have commercial insurance, and you either have what's called group insurance, where you get it through your employer, so you're part of a large group that kind of spreads the cost out, or you have an individual policy. And individuals don't have that group, and those policies are really expensive, right? And then we've got this big gap. People who aren't on Medicaid, aren't 65, they don't meet the categories for Medicaid, and they don't have a workplace a coverage to the workplace. We're the only industrialized nation that has that curious gap in coverage, but that's sort of the, the healthcare system. So here's what the Affordable Care Act did. Basically, it expanded Medicaid. It said, okay, everyone with an income below 138% of the federal poverty level is covered by Medicaid. They also recognized that individuals who weren't on Medicaid, many of them still didn't have enough money to buy a private commercial policy, so they provided subsidies for those people through the exchange, and the subsidies went down as their income went up. So those are the two main components, and it narrowed the gap. It added 20, 23 million people to coverage. 
It also did things like prohibited insurance companies from denying coverage because you had a pre-existing condition. It let kids um, stay on their parents' policies until they're 26. And it also provided, it required a basic set of benefits. So a really good solid set of benefits if, you, if you're an insurance company and wanted to sell insurance on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the exchange. So um, that brings us back to the national health care debate. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from a guy named Thomas Pinchon in a book called Gravity's Rainbow. And he says, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. And I submit that both the Democrats and the Republicans are asking the wrong question and they're trying to solve for the wrong problem. Did it ever occur to you that healthcare is the only economic sector that produces goods and services that none of its customers can afford, but all of whom will one day need, sometimes literally as a matter of life and death, at which point the cost is pretty irrelevant to the person seeking care or the person giving the care. And the only way a system like that can work, or a market can work, is if that care is heavily subsidized. So really what the national debate is about, it's a partisan, bitter debate, ideological debate, about who's going to get publicly, pub, public subsidy to help pay for your, their health care and who isn't. That's what it's all about. Public subsidies. Now, it's interesting that both the Republicans and the Democrats actually agree on a number of things. You'd never know that from the rhetoric or from the news coverage. First of all, they both have recognized that, um, that Medicaid should be expanded to cover low-income adults without kids. They call them able-bodied able adults, but, but not just the original categories. It should be expanded. So there's agreement on that. There's also agreement that some people with low incomes uh, need a subsidy to help them buy private insurance. And they've all agreed that nobody can afford the cost of health care, right? So that everyone needs some third party to help them pay. So that's either Medicaid in this case or the commercial market. So those are areas of agreement. The areas of disagreement are A, how much, um, how, how many people should be covered by Medicaid. So the uh, President Obama expanded this to 138%. The bill that passed Congress ratchets that back to 133%. So it drops a number of those people off, off coverage. The Democrats in their Affordable Care Act provided those subsidies for people who needed help with commercial insurance through the exchange uh, by giving them subsidies for their premiums. The, I think the Republican bill eliminates that and just gives everybody a tax credit. I'm not quite sure how much to help them buy insurance on the exchange. They also agree that health care costs too much. And so they're arguing about how much the cost of Medicaid should be picked up by the federal government and how much the state should pay and how to control the overall cost of the Medicaid program. The problem is that although they're talking about cost, they're not talking about system cost. They're not talking about the cost of the goods and services we're buying, just who's going to pay the bill when it comes due. Right? They're not talking about the cost of medical care, but who's going to pay for it. And that's not an ideologic problem. That is a blind spot, because ultimately the bill is unaffordable for individuals and for the state and federal governments uh, that, are, that, are, that are paying for it. So by looking at cost as something we can't change. So both the Democrats and the Republicans approach this by, by assuming that cost, we can't, the cost of medical care is what it is, right? Right? Treatment for hepatitis, hepatitis C, $95,000 a person, no problem. That's, that's, it is what it is. By accepting that, you narrow the solution space to these three variables. So you can manage the cost, not control it, but manage the cost by dropping people from coverage, which is what this bill does. It throws a bunch of people off the Medicaid program. Or you can cut the benefits. And the Republican bill allows states to request waivers to dummy down the basic benefit package. Or to allow insurance companies to once again discriminate based on pre-existing conditions. And those just shift costs back on the individuals. If your premiums and deductibles go up, at some point you can't afford care. And here's, I call it the big why, or maybe the big blind spot. Those people still get care. When you throw people off the Medicaid program by changing income eligibility, when you try to provide a benefit package that doesn't provide coverage for major medical occurrences, when you increase co-payments and deductibles to the point that you can't afford care, or if an employer just stops providing coverage, those people go back into the coverage gap. And guess what? They go to the emergency room and they get sick enough. And I used to see them all the time. And in the emergency room, federal law requires that they be seen and treated. And those uncompensated costs 
are shifted back to people who have private insurance, and that re reflects in higher bills, and higher bills then push copayments and deductibles back up, creating a cycle. So we have a system that won't pay pennies to manage your blood pressure in the community, but they'll pay thousands of dollars to treat your stroke in the hospital. Or we won't provide prenatal care to all low-income women, but we'll resuscitate your 500-gram infant in the hospital. Doesn't make any sense, and we don't save any money by doing this, right? <clears throat> So, the thing that I think needs to change about the debate is we need to recognize that we're not solving for insurance. This isn't a health insurance problem, it's a health care problem. By, by assuming that actually we can do something about cost, by making it a vari variable, you do that by saying, look, this isn't about making insurance more affordable, it's about making people healthier. And to make people healthier, Medical care has to be affordable, but there's a lot of other things we have to do. We have to make sure that you have a good house and, and that you can get a good job, that you have a stable attached family to raise your kids in, right? So that changes the dynamic significantly. So I think the two, the two things that, we, 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 that, that, that need to be looked at as we reframe this debate is how do we reduce the cost of medical care so it's growing at a rate lower than the rate of growth of public revenue, right? So instead of eating up the rest of the budget, you actually create some savings. And secondly, we need to take some of those savings and invest them in some of those social investments that we talked about earlier that have a much bigger impact on people's lifetime health status and keep them out of the acute medical system in the first place. So Oregon actually has done a lot on that first point. The coordinated care organizations that we created in 2011, I'll just give you the, uh, the, the, the high points. So in 2011, um, we, had a, we were right in the middle of the Great Recession, if you recall. And, um, one of the reasons it's hard to reform the medical system is because we keep paying for it. And if you keep paying for the status quo, there's no incentive to change it. Well, in 2011, an incentive arrived in the form of a $1.2 billion hole in our Medicaid budget. And that was due to the fact that um, uh, employment was high, so a lot of people were signing up for the Oregon Health Plan, and we had a big, you know, big general fund for so that would, have, that would have amounted to a 39% cut in payments to doctors and hospitals if we covered all those people. And, and that, that got more attention. So uh, we made some administrative changes. We changed the benefit a little bit on our priority list. And we front end loaded the money we did have into the first year of Oregon's two year biennium. And that reduced the cut from 11, 39% down to about 11% that people thought they could live with. But it left this $250 million hole in the second year of the biennium. $600 million if you use the federal match. And our plan was we were going to save that money by transforming the Medicaid care model to get more value for each dollar that we spend. And we had no idea how we were going to do it. If, you, if you've ever looked at the Webster Dictionary definition of betting on the come, it's that you don't have what you need, but you're betting that when the time comes that you need it, it will show up. So we, in 2012, we passed legislation to set up these coordinated care organizations. But by that time, it was clear that even if we could get serious cost savings, we couldn't get it fast enough to close that budget hole in, 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 within that one year period. So I went off to Washington, D.C. on March, May 1st of 2012, and we convinced the Obama administration not only to give us the waivers necessary to use this new care model to provide Medicaid in Oregon, but we got a $1.9 billion five-year investment in exchange for uh, not reducing any benefits per enrollment and, but reducing the cost trend, the rate of growth of Medicaid from 5.4% per person per month to 3.4%. And state revenue growth is about 4%, right? So we're driving it down below the growth of state revenue in Oregon. And we had to meet really strict uh, outcome and quality requirements and satisfaction requirements. And that's exactly what happened. And, and, and we got this money, that 1.9 billion, not to simply prop up the old Medicaid program during this revenue shortfall of the Great Recession, but to change the program. So that money gradually went down over five years as the cost savings of the coordinated care organizations came up. And that's exactly what happened. So over that five-year period, we've saved $1.7 billion. That's after paying back the 1.9. And it's anticipated that over 10 years, the cumulative savings, both state and federal money, from the Oregon, from the Oregon Health Plan will be $8.6 billion. About over six of that is federal money. So, one of the arguments that the authors of the, the, the American Health Care Act, the Republican bill, is that they want to reduce the cost of Medicaid. And they're doing it by throwing people off the program 
and increasing co-payments and deductibles and cutting benefits. If every state reduced its Medicaid program commensurate to what Oregon did, the 10-year savings is $570 billion. That's without denying care, without denying enrollment, without cutting benefits. So the point is, we have demonstrated that it's, that it's definitely possible uh, to do that, and that should help inform, I think, the national debate uh, on, on health care. So, um, uh, so the next real step, I think, is to try to begin to, um, um, again, drive down the cost of medical care itself so that it's growing at a, at a rate slower than the rate of general revenue, and then reallocate some of those resources out into the community uh, to try to uh, address some of the social determinants of health. Now, I'm going to just say a couple quick words here, and then we can, we can get into a discussion. But I think that, you know, Medicaid's about 14% of the, of the uh, it's probably a little bit higher than that now, it's probably about 20, a little over 20% with the expansion. So we have about a million people in Medicaid in Oregon, one out of about every four people. But ultimately, this kind of cost savings is, need to be driven into the private commercial market as well, and Medicare as well, right? So it shouldn't be just the Medicaid program, it needs to be driven out further. And that brings us to this whole question of total cost of care. What we did in Oregon is actually reduce the total cost of care, or the rate of growth of that care. And we have a, um, a um, let's see, there we go. Am I going backwards? Here we go. We have something called the Oregon Healthcare Quality Corporation that we created in, let's see, probably 2003, first time around. Uh, it, it looks at cost and quality issues, and they issued a report in February, and you can look, it on, look at it online, that compared five regional commercial markets, Oregon, Utah, uh, Minnesota, St. Louis, there's one other in there, and they compared them in terms of quality and, and cost. And what they found is that um, while Oregon had the lowest utilization, that is, we had the lowest rate of using hospitals and ERs and medical, you know, of all five regions, we had the highest costs. 17% above the regional average. And they estimated that if, that if, if the two highest cost regions, which was Oregon and Minnesota, were re to reduce their cost just a tiny bit, 2.5%, about $9 per person per month, you'd save $200 million a year across all commercial payers. And in Oregon, we had 143 clinics that participated in this study. Um, all primary care clinics, and they all had to have at least 600 commercial insured people. So this, so this was in commercial insurance. And the upper left-hand quadrant is high quality, low cost, and down here is, is high cost, low quality. And you can see they're all over the map. But if the, if the estimate was that if you could move all the clinics to just the average of the top 25 top performing clinics, you would save $2 billion a year across Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurance. So if you take those two those two points, that is the ability to actually reduce the cost of care without throwing people off, without cutting benefits, without, without jeopardizing outcomes, and the fact that there's huge room over on the commercial side to do exactly the same thing. To me, those are the ingredients for uh, a solution, and that's what the United States Congress ought to be solving on, not simply moving the deck chairs on the di di uh, uh, Titanic, you know, at the expense of individuals who really don't have much of a voice. And we can do this, we've demonstrated it here in our state, and I think that, uh, we need to do all we can to change the debate in D.C. And, and hopefully have a much more productive outcome than we've seen every over the past six years. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Folks, for those of you that aren't familiar with the forum, and I know a few more people have come in since we started, at our regular noon lunch meetings, Mondays, September through June, you need to be a paid up member of the forum in order to ask our speaker questions. And many of folks here I know are paid up members. But what we decided to do for our evening program is, if you have a question of interest, if you have a question that you'd like to ask the governor, please sign, line up over there. There's the microphone. And you do not have to be a member. But just you know, in case you want to feel guilty and discuss about how the forum manages to stay alive, and we do that through donations and memberships. If you're interested in joining, let me know. See, uh, see me, see our treasurer we have, who will raise his hand. There he is. And we have board members around. But today, it's about a conversation on health care. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to line up for questions, that would be just great. And I'll turn the mic back over to Governor Kitsap. It is on. Speak up. Okay, um, Karen Stratton, I am a 
Forgive me, it'll be on in just one second. Try again, please. Hello, there we go. All right, Karen Stratton, forum member. My question is, what exactly or generally did you do to reduce costs in Oregon? So basically, um, uh, the, the, most, the single most important thing is we capped them. I mean, we, what we did is we, we, we basically agreed as a part of the waiver to, to limit growth to 3.4%, right? So, so there was a, 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 a limit. That created a whole set of incentives to change the way care was delivered. So one thing is there was, the care was coordinated. Instead of, so most of the people in the, on the Oregon Health Plan now have a primary care, uh, a, a patient-centered primary care home. So it's like a team. So they, that helps them coordinate the care so they're not looking through the system to try to find the care they need when they need it. It would dramatically reduce ER visits because people had a place to go to, to be managed. There became an incentive then for the hospitals. So a hospital gets a bunch of money every time they put somebody in the hospital, right? And, and, and so there was an incentive to admit and readmit people to the hospital. But now since the budget's limited, they're gonna make more money by keeping them out of the hospital. Right? So there became a much more intentional, when you were released with congestive heart failure, a team would go out and meet you at your home and make sure that you were taking care of yourself so you didn't have a reoccurrence of that congestive heart failure. So basically, there was an economic incentive. There's no question about that. That cap changed the internal incentives. And then there was this, um, this effort to coordinate care uh, and a, a real emphasis on, on primary care. Can I follow up? Of course. Um, so you're suggesting that at the federal level, instead of just telling um, hospitals and insurance companies to, to pay whatever they charge, that there should be a limit on what is allowable as charges? I do. I do believe that. And, because and, and, isn't there currently um, a law that says they can't be negotiated? Well, for prescription drugs, uh, when Medicare Part C was, uh, was implemented, which I think was 2002 or 2003, in the mid-2000s, um, the drug companies got in a provision that prohibited, prohibited Medicare from using its volume to negotiate price discounts. So that's got to be changed. But if you were to, if Met, just Medicare and Medicaid, uh, if you look at the number of people on Medicare and Medicaid, if that uh, use that volume to negotiate uh, drug reductions with the price with the, with the drug companies, you see a dramatic reduction in cost. Because you can buy these same drugs for a fraction of what they cost in the United States, in Europe, uh, and, in, and in Canada. Thank you. Yeah, um, Tim Hutchinson, board member. Um, <clears throat> uh, she kind of hit on what I'm going to ask you. Um, you know, uh, if I understand the way the Oregon plan works, one of the things that you did was you looked at kind of cost efficiency and different treatments. And uh, so uh, I guess one of the ideas would be that you would do more preventive things, which would then uh, result in people not needing health services. Is that correct? Right. I mean, so yeah. if, you, if you emphasize primary care, you're seeing someone early on on a regular basis, getting your, you know, your well child, you know, getting your physicals, getting your mammograms, getting your, et yeah. cetera. Right? Well, so, so the, but the, the thing that uh, occurs to me, and I think has has happened in in the healthcare community, is you know the the healthcare industry is used to a certain amount of revenue. So and let's call that X. So <clears throat> if we do all these you know uh, preventive healthcare services, which result in uh, people not needing health care, what, don't we need some part of a program that prevents the health care industry from then just, you know, ratcheting up the cost to cover the shortfall in how much revenue, in other words, so they're used to getting X revenue, and so all of a sudden, let's say we save 10% because people aren't as sick, so now they're making X times 10, minus 10%, so their response is they just raise their prices 10% because basically they can. So, so how does that, you know, know in other, other words, words, what happens is it's going to, let's say, you, you think you're going to save, you know, 500 billion or whatever, but what happens is the healthcare industry is used to getting that 500 billion, so 
their response to all of these measures is that they just raise the prices. So, um, first of all, I think the most important part is to move from fever service to a capitated system. So fever service, that's how I was trained. So you come to me, and I do a bunch of services, and I get paid for each service. So the incentive is the more I do, the more I get paid, right? Um, that, that's sort of ass backwards if you think about it, right? I mean, they, all the incentives are all the wrong way. So if you, if you are capitated, you have a certain amount per person, obviously you're going to try to figure out how to keep that person well. Now the old HMOs in the day were really, in many of them, were sort of driven by the accountants. They were just trying to figure out how to reduce cost because they weren't required to meet outcome and quality standards. But what we did with the coordinated care organizations, you were, you were, it was definitely capitated, but you also were held to very um, high standards in terms of outcomes and quality. So that created the incentive to begin to reorganize the system. Now it's very true that uh, the healthcare industry is 20%, almost 20% of our economy. It's huge, right? Uh, in Portland, about half the biggest employers are hospitals and health systems. If you go to rural Oregon, some of the, the biggest employers are often hospitals, right? So you have, to be, you have to recognize that this, A, this isn't going to happen overnight. B, we're not talking about, we're talking about reducing the rate of growth. We're not talking about sending it down, right? We're going to reduce the rate it's increased. And you have to recognize that it's going to take, you know, it took us five years to implement the coordinated care organization. So it's going, there's going to take, there's going to be a glide path when you, when, when these changes have to take place. And you're going to face things like, what are you going to do if you reduce the number of ICU beds in a hospital? What are you going to do with a $75,000 ICU nurse? And the answer is, create a, a $75,000 community health worker that's helping people with congestive heart failure stay at home and not go into the hospital. So it's not about, it's basically changing, you're going to have to do some work, work, workforce retraining, and, but, that, but if you have five or ten years to do it, you can get ahead of that curve. So this, this is, you know, at the one that the thing we had, um, the forum we had at, um, uh, about a week ago, I had this little spiel, I don't have it on these slides, but do you remember when, uh, how many of you remember when Jack Kennedy gave the speech about going to the moon? Some of you were alive then, right? And, you know, it was just really stirring, if, if, if you remember. And he didn't give us a roadmap. He gave us a destination. He said, this is where we're going to go. And it, it, it galvanized the passion and the ingenuity and the creativity of this nation. And we did it in eight years, right? And surely, if we gave ourselves eight years to figure out how to shave two or three points off the total cost of care, then those questions are going to arise. It's not going to happen overnight. There are real obstacles and issues, but let's get them on the table. Let's, let's decide this is where we're going to end up. So the question becomes not what we're going to do, but how we're going to get it done. And I think that's the real key. Uh, Spencer, uh, Spencer Ehrman, Ehrman, forum member. If any of, it, if any for, of it, for those, for, for those of us who have been in a hospital and received medical care, medical care um, and have looked and at our hospital, looked at our hospital bill, bill, we see, we and, see we've and we've insurance. had insurance, um, we'll see, um, we'll that, see maybe that maybe the bill was for $1,000, <laughs> and that, and that, that the, the insurance company, company paid, paid um, $300. $300. Uh, um, how can we how begin, can we begin to, to think about the cost of health care when it's so when difficult, it's so difficult to, you for, as for as a consumer to see what the cost, what of, the cost of healthcare is. I'm the consumer. I'm the consumer. But, I'm really but I'm really not. My insurance, My insurance company, is the, company is, the is the consumer. And they've, and they've done, a done a deal with the hospital, with the hospital with the or with the provider to say, to say we'll, pay we'll pay X. We'll pay a third, we'll pay a third of X for a given procedure. procedure. Uh, how do, uh, I, get how do I get involved in that? Well, I, well, I'm, um, um, I, 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 I'm not opposed to the free, the free market at all. The free market's great, market but, but, but it doesn't work with health care. Because, because when you get hit by the laundry truck, you're not going to shop around, shop around, around and figure out where you're going to get the best deal. Uh, and, the uh, and the information asymmetry is staggering. Amount, the amount of complexity, complexity of modern medicine, modern medicine is so complex, complex that there's no way that the average citizen is going to be able to figure, out. figure that out. So that's, that's, so we need, so I think we first of all think we need to acknowledge that. Secondly, the hospitals in particular, there's three real big cost areas that are problematic that aren't capitated: hospital costs, pharmaceutical costs, and medical devices. So hospital, so hospital costs, there's hospital charges hospital and, charge and hospital costs, and hospital costs, and hospital costs, and hospital costs, costs determine through this really opaque process, process that's something called the charge master. 
In California, in California, those are public record. Public record. I don't think, I don't think they are in many other states. The basis is a long list of what they're going to charge for every little item. Every little that's, item. Where that's where you see the you know, five dollar you know, wooden tongue wooden tongue presser, presser show up. Show up. And, and I'll, I'll, give I'll give you an example. I had a, a, a skin cancer skin taken cancer taken off my here. nose here. I'll probably tell. Uh, maybe, 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 maybe I'm just, just the same now as I did before. Who knows? But when I, but when I can, you know, they did a great job, great job sewed it up. They wanted me to come back, and to come back and get the stitches taken out, you know. So I pretty much know how to take stitches out. But I went back, and they and they got out got out gloves, the rubber gloves, and then they got out the disposable tray that had inside of tweezers, you know. And and I won't mention what it cost, but I went back and looked at it. It's staggering. Right. Um, and so um, those things, so add, those up, things so add up. So you we need, need we need real transparency, real transparency in, hospital. in hospital pricing. And, and, I, think and, 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 and I think that I think you have to change the business model. The idea over this five or ten years is to begin to change, to change the business model. Now, now every, successful every successful business like Nike, business like Nike and Intel does, does that all the time. They see the world, they see the world changing around them and they change their business model. We're going into a period of it's going to be economic scarcity for healthcare. We've got a twenty-two trillion dollar national debt driven by a driven by margin, by margin of, of Medicare and Medicaid, and ultimately, and ultimately, ultimately we're going to have to make a choice between defaulting, between defaulting on, the on the national debt, which we won't do, or dramatically ratcheting back those costs. So we need to decide that we're going to do some modest reduction in the rate of increase in medical care as a national goal, and then turn our attention to how we're going to make that happen. What are the very real obstacles? What are, you know, who's going to get economically dislocated? How are we going to address those things? And um, uh, I, I, think we're, I think this is simple compared to going to the moon. It's a lack of will, it's a lack of vision, and it's a lack of focus. If I can follow up, why will the hospital or the, the, the medical provider show that the cost of the, what, the, the fee is $1,000 if they're willing to take $300? they are not going to go out of business because they're taking $300 from all of the different insurance companies with whom, from whom they're collecting uh, the, their fees. Um, most of the people who come are probably insured. Um, if they're not, then they're writing it off. I, I, I don't. I don't understand how it works. Why charge a thousand if you know you're going to get three hundred? Well, that's uh, yeah. If you, you can go on and Google hospital charges and hospital costs. They're, they're two major, two different things. So, I mean, this is really complicated. But you know, we have this consolidation of insurance companies. We've actually got three giant mega insurance companies, Unida and Aetna, and what they'll do with that consolidated power, they can go down to hospitals and you know, their medical groups and say, okay, um, if you want the thousands of people who are insured through United, you're going to have to give us a, a really good rate. Right? So that, that drives down hospital costs. But it's, it's really, a, it's like a, uh, it's like whack-a-mole, right? It's, a, it's, it's incredibly complicated, but it's about the money. It has very little to do with improving the health of the population, you know, and um, there, it, it, we have models all over the world on how to do this. We don't have to go to a British system. We don't have to have a socialized medicine. We can have a, a, a private system, but there has to be some uh, connection between the medical care provided and the health that results. Right? I mean, what if what if what if you had what if you were bought a car and the company that made the car had a, a you know an error rate of thirty percent in its brakes? I mean, would you buy that car, right? I mean, so it's, it's, I'm not saying this is easy, and I don't have all the answers, but I'm simply saying that we can't merely go on the way we're going. We're leaving our kids with a staggering burden of debt. Who's going to pay that $22 trillion, right? And, 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 and we have, this country has the ingenuity, uh, and I, do, I think the heart to do it, but we have to change the debate from just how do you, how do you, by health insurance, to how do you make the nation healthier, and what's the role that our medical system plays in that? Yeah, I'm John Bell, a former member. I'm, I'm concerned, concerned about all the expenses, expenses we have at end of life procedures. procedures. Uh, we, we, I mean, I'm, I'm 81, but I still in the years. But I'll spend my last two years of my life, 90% of the money for my uh, medical care will go for services in the, in the last two years maybe, or six, six months, months, I'm not sure how much I'll be in the nursing care or in emergency care. But it seems to the wrong end to pay the minimum. It should have more people taking care of themselves during their lifetime with the clinics and with, so they won't have to have all this extra care in their life. 
and parts of the whole another debate around uh, in the life decisions. So uh, I, I'm going to use the example I used at the, at the one last week, but I think it's I think this is a really good question. The three areas. The three areas where you can reduce the most cost and get the greatest benefit are investing more in early childhood and in stable families, and, and so they, you know, they, you know, if you look, there's something called the ACE study, adverse childhood experiences, that shows that there's a direct relationship between chronic childhood stress and behavioral and physical health problems later in life. So, as we talked earlier, it's spending some more money in the front end to prevent this stuff. That's one. Managing people with chronic illnesses in their home and in the community, not even out of the hospital, that's two. And the third one is end of life care. And I think if the system is set up to uh, force people into end of the life situations that no one wants, I've never met anyone who wants to spend their last days in an acute care hospital. So the story I want to tell you real quickly, uh, and, 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 and the reason is that we don't talk about this very often. And when we do, people say death panels, right? So my mother, my dear mother, who uh, would have been 100 years old on April 30th, this last April 30th, she died in 2005, and she was 88, and she um, was very frail, and uh, she developed a lot of muscle pain. So I took her to the doctor, and uh, the doctor, um, she had uh, what's called a high urethroid sedimentation rate, which is a nonspecific indicator of inflammation, really high, and she has some blood in the stool, so all the likelihood of some kind of an occult cancer. And the workup would have been hugely invasive, and she didn't want it done. And the doctor said, um, well, we'll just check your blood work every couple of weeks to see how you do. And I'm sitting there, and I said, why? And there's this very uncomfortable silence. And I said, you know, if you keep checking your blood work on an 88-year-old woman, you're going to continue to find abnormalities because she's 88. And if you're not going to track them down, why do the blood work? I have a friend that said, there's no such thing as a healthy human being, only one who hasn't had enough diagnostic tests, right? <laughs> so I took mom home. And the quality of her life just changed dramatically because she and my father, who was 90, had been living around the lab. You know, what's my blood count? You know, what's the coolant level? How do I have to adjust my medication? So they were consumed by their mortality that they couldn't control. And they let go of that and they embraced what they could control, which was this lovely 65-year marriage they had. And she lived another three months, never went to the doctor again, and died um, of congestive heart failure. And, you know, it was very sad, but she was in bed. My dad was there. We were all around her. We had the Messiah playing out in the living room. It was beautiful. And here's the point about end of life care. So no one had that conversation with her earlier when she was 40 or 50 about what she wanted for the end of her life, how she wanted to be, who she wanted to be there. <clears throat> and there's this point where you, 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 it, there's a difference between cure and care. And like the salmon story, you know, death, one per person. <laughs> And, and at some point, you are no longer in the curative phase, it's the caring phase, right? And Medicare would have paid to put her in the hospital for congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, uh, all sorts of things, and the ambulance to take her there. But at the time, it didn't pay $18 an hour for a non-hospice caregiver to take her to the bathroom, do the housekeeping, buy her food, and help her around the house. And um, I believe that you don't have to tell anyone they can't go to the hospital. But I believe if that conversation was reimbursed, if, if, if it was prioritized, if a social worker or a nurse or a physician could have that conversation with people when they're 40 or 50 and with their kids, um, and if we paid for those kinds of things, most people would choose not to go to the hospital. And you'd save a lot of money and have a lot of people who would die with dignity. So I, I just think it's, again, it's, it's, that's a, a, it's not an insurmountable problem. It, the system is, is misaligned with what I think most people most people want. So again, if we're if if we're if we care enough about this, if we care enough about our kids and the, the sort of this legacy of debt we're leaving them, driven by the medical system, we should be having those conversations with one another and, and the people who represent us. This isn't rocket science. This isn't going to the moon. Good evening. I'm Marilyn McWilliams, forum member. Um, if I can, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to. Uh, remember a, a research study I read years ago showing that people who um, throughout their life have had very little care, they had no access to health care, typically that, that's the group of people who will go in the ER and insist on every kind of you know, end of life treatment to try and preserve their, their, their life. Um, so I, I really think that we're on the right track with the, the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, 
I, I wanted to ask about uh, rural areas. Uh, Oregon, I think, is a good study here. It seems to me in a lot of Oregon communities in eastern Oregon, we have um, a lot of ranchers and people who are um, not making millions of dollars. It's probably hard for them to pay a lot for their health insurance and so on. And I'm just wondering what's happening to um, the rural hospitals, how, how do they stay in business? Are they have to, having to depend on the state for subsidies to, to keep them? Yeah, so rural, rural, rural medicine in general, rural hospitals in particular, is really a challenge. Uh, we call them A and B hospitals, and then there's another category called frontier hospitals, and they're paid differently. They're given some, some additional uh, support, but they're, they're, they're pretty frail. They're pretty frail, but they're incredibly important. You know, a, a hospital in rural Oregon isn't just a hospital. It's a gathering place. It's a community center. It's where people go if there's a natural disaster, right? I mean, so they're, 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 there's m multiple values there. So I think that when you're trying to solve this problem, the answer looks different in metropolitan parts of the state than it does in rural parts of the state. They have fewer practitioners. Telemedicine may be something more important uh, in those areas. But um, the, the, one of the beautiful things that the coordinated care organizations are learning is that we've got one coordinated care, it's called Eastern Oregon Coordinated Care Organization, which is almost all of Eastern Oregon, right down to Klamath, it's huge. And we've got one down in Klamath Falls, so, and we've got one in Coos Bay. So there are areas where they're experimenting and learning about how uh, uh, pr providing affordable access to care in rural parts of the state uh, is, is, it has to look different. But um, uh, um, it, it's very possible, but, you, but it's not a one size fits all at all. I mean, geographic and, and, and rural parts of the state need to be looked at somewhat differently. Hi, uh, hey. thanks very much for coming. Phil Nelson, four member and uh, 25 years attorney for Josephine Memorial Hospital in Grants Pass, with which yep. I'm sure you're so much familiar. Very, very much. They've got a great CCO down there, too. All here. <laughs> uh, I really feel there's a little elephant in the room, or a big elephant in the room, and that's publicly funded health care, which apparently works elsewhere. And I'm wondering, when 70% or so of the people apparently wanted it, we wound up with the Affordable Care Act, uh, what's going on with the government, and uh, it is, is there a problem also, uh, other than politics, with uh, kind of our society generally in terms of uh, our health care running twice what uh, European countries' health care runs from? maybe personal habits and social services and stuff. So I wonder if you could talk about publicly funded health care and maybe if that uh, is uh, affected by uh, kind of the American lifestyle. Thank you. Yeah, is my slide still up here? If I were to go one direction or another? I'll make that happen. Can you? I, can, I, I, I thought this question might come up. I have a slide on it. So, you know, the, the interesting thing about the United States is, you know, we're, we're on the one hand sort of a rugged individualist, right? Uh, but healthcare is something that no one, that none of the rugged individuals can afford, and and the the, the 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 big. So there's a cultural thing. I mean, I do think there's a different sense of solidarity in European nations. I mean, they pay a higher portion of their taxes for social services. It, I mean, it's it's it, it, they're they're used to that, right? It's 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 a it's sort of a different culture. We're completely different than that, and I'm not saying one's one's better than the other. But in this instance, um, get down here to the last slide. Um, let's see, my Here's the thing that, that we need to factor in. We have universal coverage. We have universal access. This is called the ER. So we end up, as I said, treating strokes rather than managing blood pressure. So it costs us a whole lot more as a society, both in economic terms but also in human costs, by not having some kind of basic floor, right? Because everybody's going to need medical care. And the, uh, you know, when you talk, some people talk about a single payer system as like the answer. If, if, if you have a single payer system and it's still paying for a hyperinflationary medical system, you haven't solved the problem. You're, 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 you've changed the way you're going to pay for a, a system that needs, so you need to do two, you need to do both. So we're creeping towards that right now. I mean, the number of people on Medicare and Medicaid, that is a publicly financed system. But it's a, it's a publicly financed system, but it's a private delivery system. It's not socialized medicine like uh, Europe. It's, it's still publicly financed. And so I believe that the most rational way to solve this problem um, is a system where you have some kind of publicly financed floor, um, but it's not going to be everything. And one of the things we learned in Oregon, we established our priority list, right? So there are limits. And, um, uh, I'll get in a lot of trouble for saying this, but um, choice is a matter of disposable income. 
And we may not like that, but it is. Uh, public housing doesn't look like Ritz Carlton. Uh, public transit doesn't look like the bullet train in Japan, right? Uh, so the fact is we do have limited resources. So the question is, you need to have a basic floor. It needs to be a defined benefit, and it needs to be uh, evidence-based. That that it, it, that it and um, it has to grow at a fixed amount, as we as we discussed. And I think there's more than enough money in the system to provide everybody with everything that would 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 have a, a positive in, impact on their health. And then you have a system above that where people can buy additional things if they want to, but they have to do it with their after-tax dollars. It's not subsidized, right? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, public education, everybody has agreed, well, maybe not the Secretary of Education, but everybody, most people have agreed that public education is a public good. And that's why we, we all pay, everyone who pays taxes pays for public schools, whether you have kids in school or not, rich people, poor people, we all contribute to our public education system. And all our kids are eligible for public education. And uh, they all get, if you will, the same benefit which is 12 years in the public school system. You can argue whether that's a good benefit or a bad benefit, but they all get the same thing. Now, if you want additional services, if you want, you can buy a tutor for your kids, you can buy them extra curricular activities, but you don't you do that with your after-tax dollars. That's a choice you make, right? And when we run out of money in the public school system, when it gets tight, we don't change eligibility. We don't say, well, um, we're not gonna teach the 11th grade this year, or, uh, let's say your family makes $25,000, your kids can't go to school. We don't do that. We, we never change eligibility. We never argue about it. School year gets longer, a lot just get cut. The benefit gets re reduced, but everyone stays eligible. Compare that to the healthcare system. We don't do that. What we do is we maintain the benefit, whether it's good or bad, and all the inefficiencies, and we throw people under the bus. So to me, this makes imminent sense. It would cost far less. You wouldn't have to worry about uh, holding on to a job, employers wouldn't have to worry about this hassle. You wouldn't have to do income. You wouldn't have to do the the, um, the administrative cost of, of uh, eligibility determination. It's a huge cost, and Medicare's got a very simple uh, and low administrative cost because when you turn 65, you're eligible for Medicare. Not to say there aren't problems with the Medicare program, but we have to distinguish between paying for health care and what we're buying. They're, they're two really different things. And and uh, since Congress is arguing just about the payment side. This solves a whole host of problems. And you know, the argument is it's an entitlement. Well, unless you change the federal law, the year also is an entitlement, right? And if, if, so the people that don't want to provide some entitlement to a basic level of care, the only way that works is if they pass a bill that says, if you come to the ER and I do a wallet biopsy and you're Blue Cross negative, we don't let you die in the ambulance ramp. And no one's gonna do that. So we're already doing it. We're just doing it on the back end in a crazy and inefficient way. Good evening, Governor. Mike Holcomb. Uh, my thinking is, or I'm looking at, as you're saying, public finance for commercial insurance. One of the things driving the, the discussion today in reference to the AHCA and the AECA is the insurance companies, because it's their bottom line we're talking about, and we're discussing that versus actual health care, because they're willing to go, so you're going to give me $1,200 a month or $1,500 a month or $2,000 a month. I don't care if you have a heart attack and I have to pay $100,000. I've already got 10 years of you paying $2,000 a month. So they're not, they're, the argument of money and, and the costs and how it's redistributed, it, it, I just wonder what your outlook on it is. How do we take the insurance companies out of the picture so that we're looking at health benefits, yeah. health care for persons, and longevity of all of us? Well, there, there's, there are certainly issues with the commercial insurance industry, particularly the, the big consolidated ones that are, you know, traded on the stock market and, and um, uh, uh, making, a, making a whole bunch of money. So this, this doesn't work unless the insurance company changes its business model. So if you were to, if you were to carve out, everyone in America had access to some basic level of care, the insurance industry would have to change pretty dramatically, and they'd be competing basically for people who have some disposable income. They, they do this in Australia. Look at the Australian system they have. You know, they have, everyone has basic coverage, and then there's a parallel system, and there's not much difference in quality, right? 
Um, I think the thing that the, the people on my side of the aisle need to, need to appreciate is you can't have universal coverage for everything for everybody in a world of finite resources. You, 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 you can't do it, right? So the question is, how do you, that's really what the debate we had back in 1987 with the Oregon Health Plan it was how do you, it's about the common good. How do you get the greatest benefit for the greatest number of people the resources you have? And with a system that has three trillion dollars a year in it, um, you could trim that down quite a bit and you wouldn't see um, uh, people going um, w without much that they actually need. But right now we ration people. Right? When you throw, when some of you take all the coverage you want, you ration a whole person, not just an individual service. So it's just, and I don't know how to do this. I mean, you know, Senator Wyden's in a really key spot as, as uh, the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, Earl, Congressman uh, Blumenauer is on the, uh, uh, a key committee. Kurt Schrader and, and uh, Greg Walden are both on the, on the House Committee on, uh, that has relevance. So, you know, I'm just hoping that when it gets to the Senate, we can begin to kind of change the nature of the debate because you're absolutely right, sir. I mean, this is, this is all about insurance and, and, and it's sort of divorced dramatically from individuals who need care, what they get, and whether that care actually, you know, uh, improves their, uh, their, uh, their health. Eric Squires, forum member. First, I'd like to thank you and also the current board of the, uh, the forum for bringing this issue out to the public for free today. I think that's just fantastic. I'd like to continue the previous question in a more specific way. Imagine someone with diabetes and a doctor orders up an A1C or AC3 A1C. test. A1C test, thank you. And we change the game between the patient and the insurance company in this way. We put the consumer of the healthcare as a competitor. For example, we give the diabetic a financial incentive to eat better, monitor their blood sugar, and as opposed to the insurance company doling out the money, we reward the consumer, either directly like with the Oregon Health Plan, or we mandate this through the state regulation of insurance. What I'd like to do is avail myself to that statement with uh, this question. Uh oh, this is going to be tough. <laughs> what would go wrong? Who who starts? The insurance companies start squealing. There's somebody competing for my money. Uh, the diabetics might start gaming the system. But what this would do is would in, uh, inject some competition into the system, and particularly in the case of diabetes, and it could apply for any other scenario, um, start forcing people to be healthy with multiple incentives. One, personal health, but second, a financial incentive. I'm kind of curious if that idea has traction or if it's a good idea that would just go horribly off the rails five minutes after it was implemented. Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I do think if you look at this chart here, um, a huge portion of uh, what impacts people's lifetime health status is, is lifestyle and behavioral choices. You know, what you eat, whether you exercise, um, uh, whether you smoke, uh, etc. right? So, we, we, you know, and diabetes, uh, heart, uh, heart disease uh, all have a huge relationship to lifestyle and behavioral choices. So the question is, um, um, part of it's education, but part of it's recognizing that if you, if you go to the socioeconomic place here, there's a lot of people uh, who don't actually have, the, uh, uh, this is not an apologetic statement, it's just the fact, they don't actually have the margin in their life to do that. If you live in, in a place with no public transportation, where the closest place you can get food is uh, Wendy's, uh, you know, I mean, and there are no parks. I mean, they're, they're, we just need to recognize it's a, it's a very complicated issue. I think the, 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 one of the best ways to do that is, to, uh, is through the patient-centered primary care home where you actually are part of a team that helps, uh, helps you um, understand the nature of your disease, what you need to be doing, uh, a coach, if you will. Um, I'll give you an example. In Bend, they did a study on the frequent flyers in the emergency room. Uh, and uh, a lot of were people with undiagnosed uh, uh, or poorly treated mental health and behavioral health issues. And what they did is they, they actually assigned someone to help them um, understand when they needed to come to the hospital and help them you know, manage their disease. And the, uh, the, the visits to the ER dropped dramatically. And each one of those visits, two or three of those visits, was way more than, than the cost of actually providing that kind of help. So I don't, this is a very complicated question. Uh, this gets to the question of you know personal individual responsibility, which I think is a is a huge part of this. 
Um, and if you, if you begin to change the allocation, start spending money up front, let's say you're working on trying to um, address uh, these adverse childhood experiences, um, that's, that's where you get your biggest long-term health gain. And right now in the United States, your zip code is a greater indication of your health status than your, than your genes. And, and that, that's, that's, re that's really this issue. And it's not a medical issue, it's a, it's a social issue. But it has everything to do with health and nothing to do with health care. Uh, so uh, that's a question we need to keep, I think, keep, keep, keep talking about. I don't have an easy answer for it, but I do think that obviously you can, ha you can have a huge impact on, on uh, a person's lifetime health status by trying to get uh, un unbundle that, uh, uh, that, that segment there. Okay. Thank you very much. I know that you'll be around for a few minutes. We have a few more minutes before we'll break it up and we'll have some time for Governor Kitzhaber to ask some individual questions. Of course, I enjoyed the speaker, I always do, but I always enjoy the questions too. And there was a question that was asked about the cost of health care and the example of a health care insurance company charging $1,000 but signing a contract and getting $300, et cetera. And I do appreciate that they negotiate with providers, but there's another angle. I used to be a provider. And it's amazing when you look at EOBs and they would say, cost of care, you know, bill to insurance company, $100. But because you chose Rob Solomon and we got him real cheap, we are only paying him $55. Aren't you cool? You're gonna stay with our insurance company. There's that level of marketing with insurance companies too, not just in mental health, but in hospital bills too. I wanted to take a moment to uh, thank you all for signing in. If you're not members and you want to get on our newsletter, please make sure you put your email address down. If you're members, we already got you and we send you just one newsletter a week. We don't bug you too much. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank our old part-time executive director who came back to run the video, Mr. Eric Squires. On a complete volunteer basis, because as a reminder, we're a volunteer organization. No, that's not another hit for money, just a recognition that we're a volunteer organization. And Joseph Tyner is our sound guy. He's here today helping out, and he brought a brother with him, Paul Tyner, right over there with an engineering background. We managed to get the sound pretty clear, I think. Uh, with that, folks, I'll remind you, Mondays at noon, at this coming Monday is Memorial Day. We do not have a program. The list of the upcoming programs is in front of you on your chairs. And on June 5th, we're looking forward to hearing from Erica Stock, the director of the Sierra Club, Oregon chapter, talking about the challenges to environmental advocacy. There's challenges in healthcare, there's challenges in environmental advocacy. There's an awful lot to talk about, and the forum is proud and pleased to bring you important issues. And one more time, thank you, Governor Kitzhaber. Thank you.